Hello, my name is Napoleon McClinton, and thank you for joining us for our Sunday School lesson study for today. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come today to thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Father, that you have watched over us last night and that you have kept us safe and given us a heart and a mind to praise and glorify you as we study your holy word. We pray now, Father, that you would help us to set aside any cares and concerns that we might have and that we may focus our hearts and minds on the lesson scripture, and that we may be guided and directed by your Holy Spirit, and that we may find practical applications for our daily lives. We thank you, Father, for this church, the Greater Shallow Missionary Baptist Church. We thank you, Father, for each and every member. We thank you for those that have been put in position of leadership and stewardship. We pray that you will continue to keep us safe as a church family, and that, Father, we would be the kind of church that you have called us to be, and that is a Christ-centered church, where others may come to know you through your darling Son, Jesus Christ. We pray now, Father, for our neighborhood, for our community, for our city, for our county, and for our state. We pray also, Father, for those that are sick and afflicted, and those that are dealing with the love, loss of some loved one. We pray, Father, for those that are downtrodden and those that are confused concerning the issues surrounding the global pandemic, the economic slowdown, as well as the many disasters and tragedies we see in and around our world. We pray, Father, especially for those victims that have been part of the mass shootings that have been occurring and occurring in our world most recently and in our nation most recently. We pray that you would comfort those victims, Father, that you would have them know, Father, in your word, you promised that you still love us and you would never leave us, Father. We pray, Father, also for those that are victims of the war that's going on in Ukraine. We pray that you would bless those that have been affected. We pray that you will unite the fathers or reunite the families of those that have been separated. We pray also, Father, that those that are guilty will be held accountable one day and that they, Father, will stand before your judgment seat and give an account for the deeds done in their bodies. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. And we pray, Father, that when he returns, Father, that we will be found faithful witnesses of him. We thank you, Father, again for Jesus, and in his precious name we pray. Amen. Again, I say thank you for joining us today for our Sunday School lesson study. Our study is from a new quarterly topic, as we look at the summer quarter of 2022, and our lesson topic, our quarterly topic, is entitled Partners in a New Covenant or in a New Creation. We're looking at the June series of lessons from Unit 1, and it's entitled God Delivers and Restores. And so that brings us to the June 12th lesson, which is lesson two, and it's entitled God Foretells Redemption. As we continue to look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 13. And so you see our lesson outline, which is on the screen also, and we have two teaching outlines for today's study. Our first outline is identity of the servant from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 5 of the New International Version of the Bible. Our second outline is the Lord's plan from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6 through 13 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so let's read our lesson scripture for today's discussion. And it is also on the screen. 
And our scripture is divided into two parts. Our first part is the servant of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 through 7. And our second part of the scripture is the restoration of Israel from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 8 through 13. And let's begin with Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, which is on the screen. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant lands. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadows of his hand, he hid me, or he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentile, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And then our second part is the restoration of Israel, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8 through 13. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritance to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed besides the roads and find pastors, uh, pastor on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads, and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, ye heavens. Rejoice, ye earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so let's look next at our lesson context for today's study. And it is also on our screen. As we look at lesson two, which is entitled, God Foretells of Redemption, as we studied and read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 13 of the New International Version of the Bible. And so our context reads as follows. Israel was waiting impatiently for God to act. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 10 through 13, it reads, Concerning this salvation... The prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, 
trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And while their freedom in God would certainly come with responsibility, that day would also be one of great joy. All this would be accomplished through one servant eager to do God's will. In the book of Isaiah, there are four poems about the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9, or through chapter 50, verse 11. And Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 through chapter 53, verse 12. They are called servant poems or servant songs. A fifth passage, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 4, is sometimes added through the list or to the list because it content, its content is very similar to the other even though the word servant is not used in it. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 through 13, is from the second servant song. It is more than a poem about a servant. It is prophecy about the work of Jesus, the Messiah. It is he who is the servant in the servant's poems or song. This servant song begins and ends with an appeal not only to Israel, but also to the nations of the world. The last three verses in Isaiah chapter 48 exhort the people to flee from Babylon. And assurance is given that God will care for them as they travel. What's next? And so what we see on our screen next is a chart or a picture of the servant songs that is listed in the book of Isaiah, five such songs, which will be our discussions, or our discussion for the month of June. Uh, the first one we talked about last Sunday, uh, which was June 5th, which has to do with judgment to the Gentiles when we talked about uh, the destruction of Babylon. Today's study will be Isaiah chapter 49 as we look at a light to the Gentiles. Father, we'll look at Isaiah chapter 50 and we'll talk about the Lord's promised help. And then we'll look at chapter 52 verse 13 through chapter 53 verse 12 to discuss the coming Messiah. And then as we mentioned chapter 61 verse 1 through 4 which talks about the Savior's promised renewal. All these servant songs actually leads to and points to Christ's coming and suffering on the cross to die for the sins of the world. And so our lesson begins with our first outline, which has to do with the identity of the servant. As we look at Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 through 5 of the New International Version of the Bible. And we see that this servant that we're talking about, which really is Jesus, which you ought to know by now, but as we study the lesson, it clearly will point to Jesus, is that he, the servant, is called by God. And so let's read verses 1, 2, and 3, which is on our screen together. Beginning at verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 49. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this you distant nation. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he, spoke, he has spoken my name. 
He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. And so in verse 1a, we see that the word listen is a necessary beginning or precursor to receiving any news. As God spoke to the people there about Moses in Exodus chapter 23, verse 21 through 22, and let me quote it to you or read it to you, beginning at verse 21 of Exodus chapter 23. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who pose, oppose you. And so we also see that the phrase, hear thee, hear this, which is used together with the word listen, it emphasizes that the information must be believed and act on that the servant or the prophet is speaking about or speaking, con to, uh, and speaking concerning. Without appropriate actions, the act of listening remains yet unfulfilled. When he uses the phrase islands and he uses the phrase you distant nations, this must refer to or likely refer to scattered Israel but it also to other nations that are outside of God's covenant people. In verse 1b, we see where it says, Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. God knows his intentions for the servant, even before his mother was aware that she was with child. As Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, as he's prophesying concerning this child that was going to be born to the virgin. He said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when the angel spoke to uh, Joseph, he told Joseph about this child that Mary, uh, the virgin, was to bring forth. And let me read uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, and I quote, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So more importantly than revealing the name of his servant, God's servant, is the fact that God has spoken his servant's name. God knows each of our names, and he cares about each of us personally and intimately in ways that are not possible for those that are unnamed masses. Now in verse 2, the phrase, the sharpened sword, in a prophet's mouth likely refers to the word God calls his servant to speak prophetically. God imbues or he inspires these words with authority as we see in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Although Jesus' words bring peace when they are accepted, they also act to divide the righteous from the unrighteous, as pointed out in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. And so we see in verse 2b of today's study that the phrase, the shadow of his hand or his wing, is one way to speak of the safety of being in God's care as well as God's provision. We see that from Psalm 63, verse 7, Psalms 91, verse 1, as well as Isaiah chapter 51, verse 16. Now, when the prophet 
Isaiah uses the phrase, a polished arrow, God kept the servant safe and at the ready so that when his task came, the servant would be perfectly able to accomplish the work that God had assigned to this servant. The image of the sword also implies judgment that those who do not accept the words the servant speaks, Isaiah spoke of the servant preparation. And we see in the New Testament that for 30 years, Jesus was on the path toward the cross. When the time came, Jesus stayed true to his purpose and the Father's will. The empty tomb provides proves that Jesus' pre preparation had been completed. So in verse 3, God, through the prophet Isaiah, names the speaker that is speaking in what we just read in uh uh, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 through 5, when he says, you are my servant. And he uses the phrase Israel, and we wonder why is Israel being used when God is really talking about the servant that was to come. And so one view is that Jesus is really the true Israel. And this is just simply a figure of speech because Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan a promise to bless all nations as he told uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 when he said in my seed all the nations of the world will be blessed and he was talking about in Abraham's seed so he was talking about ultimately the one that would come the promised Messiah and so Jesus really represents the pinnacle of all the nation of Israel was meant to be. And Jesus come down through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. And so we see that another possibility for using the phrase Israel is that God does speak here to the nation as the people in whom I will display my splendor. But then Israel would be fulfilled in the church, which has taken up Israel's spiritual mantle and carried the good news of the gospel of the Messiah into the entire world. Because the church is Christ's body, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit, ultimately the servant really is Christ Jesus. And so we see in our next verse, as we look at confident in God, as we read verses four through five, which is on the screen. So let's read Isaiah chapter 49, verses four through five, beginning at verse four. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. And so we see that the servant here expresses his confidence in God as we look at verse four. Because God's definition, though, of success is not a conventional earthly definition, those faithful servants of God can be sometimes discouraged. The prophet Jeremiah is an example of, of faithfully proclaiming what God wanted him to say in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 12. But from a human standpoint, Jeremiah fell because the nation of Judah did not repent, and they ultimately went into captivity, and Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in uh, 586 B.C. from 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15 through 21. Jesus also experienced moments of period of discussion. When the disciples experienced fear, uh, in place of, feast, of faith in Matthew Gospel, chapter 8, verse 26, as well as in Luke Gospel, chapter 12, verse 28. When his disciples all fled from him and betrayed him, 
in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 43 through 72. And when he hung on a brutal cross to, the, to die in excruciating pain, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, as well as Psalms 22. But Jesus had even more reason than Jeremiah for confident that his work and the reward for his work were in God's hand. Sometimes human understanding of Jesus' work was not compared to knowing that the Father who would reward his son for his faithful ministry and his sacrifice of his life on the cross for the sins of the world. And so we see the phrase in verse 5, the womb recalls from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, while the servant's future glory points back to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. This is one way Isaiah expressed the confidence that the servant would feel. Repetition of these words in this nature is typical in Hebrew poetry or in Hebrew scripture. Whereas uh, when he says here that my God has been my strength, it represents a reversal of Isaiah chapter 49 verse 4. Whereas the servant had felt that his strength was wasted, with God the strength would be renewed as well as sustained. In Isaiah chapter 12 verse 2, as well as Isaiah chapter 33 verse 2, and Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29 through 31. Now, the words Jacob and Israel are used interchangeable. We know that Jacob was one of the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as we studied. So he, Jacob was one of the sons of Isaac. But Jacob and, and Jacob's name was ultimately changed to Israel. And so Jacob becomes the progenitor of the 12 tribes or the 12 tribes of Israel. And so these are this names, these two names, Jacob and Israel, are used interchangeable as they were in the book of Genesis. Sometimes the word uh, Jacob or Israel uh, refers to uh, Israel in the book of Isaiah means only the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, or uh, as distinction from the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. We know that there were 10 tribes in the northern kingdom and there were only two tribes in the southern kingdom of Judah. Other times when we see the word Israel, it refers to all the Jewish people of both northern and southern kingdom when they were part of a united kingdom. And so this servant could only anticipate gathering Israel together and its redemption would glorify God's name. Now, Isaiah is speaking to a time that would come some 700 years uh, after he speaks this prophetic message because Jesus would be born some 700 years after Isaiah prophesied concerning this servant of the Lord. But Isaiah also now lays out what God's plan is for this servant as we look at Isaiah chapter 49, verses 6 through 13. And so our first topic comes from God's call to all. The servant would be used to issue God's plan or God's offer of salvation to all, not only to the tribes of Israel, but to all people of the world. And so let's read verses 6 and 7, which should be on your screen now. And it begins, he says, is it too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel. To him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because the Lord, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. 
And so in verse 6a, the main thing to remember out to remember about this verse, verse 6a, is that it is a prophecy involving the servant of the Lord, and that its fulfillment would be certain because God speaks through the prophet what thus says the word. Nothing in the history of the tribes of Jacob or the nation of Israel suggests that restoring the people would be too small a thing. The people themselves had struggled with faithfulness throughout their days in Egypt, as well as their time in the 40 years of wilderness wandering, and as well as the time they had spent in the promised land. By the time Isaiah begins his prophecy, the northern kingdom has already been taken captive into Assyria by the Assyrian nation or the Assyrian empire. It would be some hundred and so years later that Babylon, 150 years later, that Babylon would take the southern kingdom of Judah into exile into Babylon. And so this prophecy that Isaiah is talking about were, were, were that they had always at one time been a united nation. But because that idolatry had sneaked into both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, it was the contributing factor that caused them to be fractured into the northern ten tribes as well as the southern two tribes. And so the way God speaks to the servant here suggests that not only Judah would be restored, but all the tribes, the ten tribes to the north would also be restored. So the ten tribes that had been lost in Assyria or that had uh, been assimilated into people that would be later called Samaritans during the time of Jesus, uh, and this had been for generations. So this was a huge task, easy only for God to accomplish through his servant that he promised that would come one day. And so God's plan was for the message of redemption in Christ Jesus to include also Gentiles as well as the Jews, as we read in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. Paul and Barnabas cite this verse 6b as a justification for their decision to turn from preaching to the Jews to the Gentiles as we read in Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Later, Paul would write in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and I quote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And so this salvation that Paul talks about has far reach. It includes the entire world, the entire earth, as Jesus sends his disciples out in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Isaiah said that the Messiah, which is the servant of the Lord, and his disciple would bring a saving life to all peoples of the world uniting them under the banner of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Jesus did his part to bring humanity together. Certainly we can do more toward completing this task by spreading the good news, the gospel of Jesus, that he is the Messiah and he is the only one by which a sinful person can be reunited with a holy God. And so now we see in verse 7d, or 7a. What the Lord says flows from God's character or what his character is. And the titles that are attributed to God result from his actions. The Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel had acted to free his people from slavery when they were in Egypt in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, as well as Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. God chose Israel as his special people. But whether Israel acted in holiness or not, God still remained the Holy One of Israel in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 22. And so God's titles here emphasize his power and his majesty. 
as well as his fidelity or his faithfulness to his promises and his sole claim to be holy or only God is holy. And so this is the Lord who addressed him who was despised and abhorred by the nation. So he's talking about this is the holy God that is addressing the servant, the one that is uh, despised and abhorred ultimately he would be by the na nation because he would ultimately be crucified on the cross. And so being rejected by so many could make the servant wonder if God had also rejected him. But in 7b, we see where God says that both kings, though, and princes will heed this servant words. And so this must be and has to be talking about the only one, the Messiah, which is Jesus. As with any success in ministry, it is not based on the charisma or the magnetism or the leadership qualities or the preacher or the perfect servant ministry. The reason people respond with worship when hearing the gospel is because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you as his servant. And so now we see in verses 8 through 12 that the day of salvation will come one day. And that day comes when Jesus comes and he gives his life as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. And so let's read verses 8 through 12, which should also be on our screen. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritance, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pastures on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, and some from the region of Aswan. And so we see in verse 8, that the phrase, in the time of the Lord, uh, as well as the word favor and the day of salvation, these are parallel terms that denote the time when God would hear his people and act again on their behalf. Now, in the short term for the southern kingdom or for the kingdom of Judah, this would be when Judah would be returned from the Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C. But ultimately, this day of salvation is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Paul quotes this verse when he asserts in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, and I quote 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he says, in the time of my salvation, I heard you, or in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I help you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. As Paul writes there to the Corinthian people in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. There is never a bad time to accept the gift of God's salvation through Christ Jesus. The promise is primarily, though, to the servant, but it also extends beyond the included covenant people of God to restore the lands and to reassign the desolate inheritance are parallel terms also. The promise recalls the land distribution that was made by Joshua after Israel had completed the basic conquest of the promised land 
in Joshua chapter 14, verse 1. Judah had been the old left bereft or deprived after the exile, after the exile into Babylon because of their sinful nature and their idolatry. But all the land would be reassigned and be renewed one day by this servant that we talked about. In verse 9a, it relates to God's role as their redeemer, which we read in Isaiah <coughs> chapter 49, verse 7. The images, the imagery here continues the idea that those who are oppressed or in darkness may shed their fears because God has chosen to rescue them in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. And I read chapter 9, verse 2 from Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has, drawn, has dawned. So in verse 9b, we see that the abundance God promises through the servant of the Lord is so great that vegetation would grow even beside the busiest of road and even on the barren or the uh, unplowed hills that otherwise might be desolate, might be rocky, or too hard for pasture land. Idolatry was frequently associated with, associated with these high places or with these barren lands. As we read in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 30, as well as the uh, Numbers chapter 33, verse 51 through 52, and Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 2. God's promise is that his own faithful people who will be able to eat safely in places that had previously been polluted by idolatrous practice. The entire creation is God, and he will reclaim it one day from the evil or the sin that has invaded it. So in verse 10, Jesus here is the fulfillment of verse 10 in both literally as well as figuratively. As we read in Luke's gospel, chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. Also we read in John chapter 6, verse 36. Jesus encounters with the Samaritan woman at the well there speaks to his power over spiritual thirst in John chapter 4, verse 10, as well as verses 13 through 14. The feeding of the 5,000 demonstrate that Jesus is more than capable of alleviating hunger in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 30, 21. Now in verse 11, when this servant of the Lord lead the people the mountains there will be a safe way to cross. The highways that's spoken of there likely refers to those desert roads that would be sunken, that ultimately would be raised, making them less treacherous to follow. In verse 12, these faithful pilgrims who make the journey to return back to God or to return back to Jerusalem would also come from afar. This could imply that the return of the 12 tribes or the 10 tribes of Israel that had disappeared to the north into Assyria and the arrival of those Gentile people that would come from the Mediterranean uh, that would come from the west. The exile of those in Babylon that would return from the east and the region of Aswan which likely refers to lands near the southern border of Egypt, which obviously is down in the African country, as suggested by a copy of the scroll of Isaiah found in the deep sea scrolls. So people would come from everywhere uh, at the call of this servant. The call of Christ Jesus is meant to be for all and to all who would come. And so now we look at this call in verses 13, as we read verse 13 on the screen, which has to do with a call to joy. Shout for joy, ye heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, ye mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion 
on his afflicted one. And so in verse 13, shout, rejoice, and burst into song are all parallel terms. The repetition here of these three emphasizes that joyful song is the correct impulse following God's work of redemption through his son, Christ Jesus. So Isaiah calls all creation to enter into praise when the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on those that have been afflicted. Paul picks up this theme when he declares that creation still suffer from God's people, will still suffer until God's people are revealed as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 22. And let me read that for your hearing. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present day. And so let's read our conclusion for the day as we see on the screen what has to do with speak and sing. It says, at the right time, God sent Jesus to earth to offer salvation to all who accept him as Lord and Savior. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, as well as Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5. So the call is to those who are in our families and communities and also in far distant villages we will never visit or even know exist. Our responsibility in the time of salvation is twofold. One is to proclaim the good news to all, as Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 12, and the other is to worship God with all creation. We are confronted, we are confident, and we experience mercy. Therefore, sing to God and spread the good news throughout the earth. Our thought to remember is that salvation is now. The day of salvation is now. Jesus says in Matthew Gospel, Chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and I quote, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of this age. Let us close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the study of your word. We thank you, Father, for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the servant of the Lord, which we come to know to be your son, Jesus. For even Jesus himself quotes some of these uh, servant songs as he read from the scroll that was handed him in Isaiah chapter 61, concerning the spirit of the Lord was upon him and that you had sent him to preach the good news. We thank you, Father, for the good news and help us to be those that might be willing and able and go forward and share this good news wherever we shall be, in our homes, in our communities, in and where we should go. For the world is desperately and hungrily and still under the curse, Father, of sin and waiting for the Savior to come. But he's already come and he offers up salvation to the world when he died on the cross. 
But he's coming again, Father, to reward those that have put their faith in him. Thank you for Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Thank you for your participation. May God continue to bless and keep you is my prayer. Have a blessed day. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go, go, go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go, go, go. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. Go! 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 If you love me, really love me, feed my my sheep if you love me really love me feed my sheep